Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 447 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by a former heavyweight world title challenger, the main man himself, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how are you doing this week, my friend? I'm doing great, my brother. How are you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. We're going to start with a review part, as always. We're going to dive straight in at the Edeon Arena Osaka in Osaka, Japan. Over here, my favorite, well, I don't know if he's my favorite, but one of my favorite boxers from Puerto Rico. This man being Emmanuel Rodriguez. He was unfortunately dethroned of his IBF bantamweight world title. A unanimous decision there away from home in Japan against the home fighter Ryosuke Nishida. Now 9-0. So he takes the, the title away there from Rodriguez. Can't say I saw the fight. Uh, moving now to the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. This one, of course, I did see. I managed to find a really good stream for this, actually. Didn't cut out once. Um, I'm going to start on the undercard over here. Uh, like I say, it was on Amazon Prime Video. It was on um, the Zone pay-per-view. But yeah, let's start down the undercard. Jesus Ramos returned to the ring with a TKO win for him in round nine against Johan Gonzalez, who's now 34 and three. Gonzalez gets stopped for the first time there by Ramos, who was coming off a really bad performance last time out against Eriksson Lubin. He's now 21 and one. Also on the card, uh, we had him on. I think it was, what, two weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Mario Barrios, he's now 29-2. and two, A unanimous decision there over 12 rounds against Fabian Maidana, the brother of Marcos Maidana, now 22-3. and three. That one was for Barrios's WBC interim welterweight world title. Maidana down in round three. Um... Yeah, it was a straight right hand that put him down in that third round. I didn't think he was particularly hurt too much, but a really slow fight, Eddie. A really boring fight, to be totally honest with you. Um, Maidana had, you know, a very low punch output, I think, and it was it was hard to watch. In all honesty, you know, it wasn't like, um, you know, the the chief support that we wanted to see. You know, I think the whole card itself, you know, there was a lot of fights going the distance, and like I say, you know, it was it was one of those fights where, you know, you're expecting a nice fight, a nice co-main event to bring you into the main event. But it didn't really deliver. Like I said, it was quite boring. Uh, Mario Barrios as well. His right eye swole up really badly as well. Um, but yeah, I think he won the fight. I think he won the fight quite clearly. But... Yeah, it was it was a fight that I think I'm going to probably forget by by next week. It it just it didn't do anything for me. I don't know what you made of it. I know that we we've got quite a few things to get through, so keep it short and sweet, Eddie. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely didn't you know live up to the kind of you know similar lined up fight for a, for a, you know <laughs> for Canelo you know with especially with this kid who made it really really fun at least early. Um, but I, I will say this is as boring as it was. I really was surprised at how good a boxer, <laughs> uh, geez, I can't even, uh, uh, Madonna's brother actually was skill wise. Like his punches looked pretty precise. He was, he, he did things good defensively when he was focused. Uh, he landed some good counter shots. Um, if he was more active and, you know, took a few more chances. The fight would have been much more interesting. But he was surprisingly really, really good as a boxer. He just, if he had his brother's hammer, oh, my goodness, he would have probably got Barrios out of there. But um, 
all in all, it just wasn't wasn't the kind of fight uh, action wise that you would want to see, especially uh, you know pre pre uh, previous to um, what's going to happen in the main event with um, you know Canelo and and I can't think of the name right now. But anyway, yeah, it was it just wasn't it just it wasn't it. But like I said, I took that he could box really well, and it kind of surprised me for being Madonna's brother. You know, you just would kind of figure he would be that no style come in just bomb you out kind of guy but not at all the case so yeah i know it's, it'd be weird for me to say this but if he could get himself together and, and put more punches together i would like to see him see him again because i really liked his his skill level as a hardcore guy but anyway um yeah that was it <laughs> you don't know the definition of short and sweet eddie but let's move on Let's move on. Um, we're going to go now to Brandon Figueroa, another friend of the show. He's now 25 and 1 with a draw. Um, he successfully defended his WBC interim featherweight world title with a ninth round KO against Jesse Magdaleno, now 29 and 3, still in search of win number 30. A left hook to the body in the end in that ninth round with one second left in the round, you know, he simply could have got straight back up and gone back to his corner, but he simply couldn't do it, it was a paralyzing shot, um, yeah, I think the fight itself, you know, it took a few rounds to kind of warm up, I think Brandon Figueroa started quite slow, um, like I say, I think it was kind of his fault that it took a few rounds for the fight to, to, to warm up, you know, he, he needed to, he needed to kind of put the pressure on a little bit sooner than he did but listen in the end it you know it wind up working out for him but Magdalena was quite sharp early on you know his hand speed his counters they were working nicely and Figueroa seemed a tiny bit frustrated but like I say after about three rounds Figueroa did then turn it into his kind of fight and he began to dominate and it was a good ending to the fight from him you know obviously it's a fantastic shot but you know, he started to kind of run away with the fight, I think, and, um, you know, he turned up the pressure like he does, I love watching Brandon Figueroa fight, you know, he's a seriously effective dude, I think he'd be one of the guys you'd want on your team if you were gonna, you know, have like a bar brawl, you definitely want Brandon Figueroa on your team rather than against you, it doesn't matter if he's a little guy, um, so yeah, good win for him, like I say, happy for him, and moving to that, well, no, there's one more fight to mention before we move to the main event. Um, Imantis Stanionis, now 15-0, a unanimous decision for him over 12 rounds against Gabriel Maestra, who loses his O. He arguably should have lost that O a few fights back. He's now 6-1 and one with a draw. It was for the WBA welterweight world title. Um, tricky first few rounds for Stanionis, you know, he definitely got hit more than most people expected he'd get hit throughout the contest, and he got made to respect the power of Maestre, I think, you know, um, Stanionis won wide in the end, but like I say, Maestre didn't fade at all, and a lot of people felt that Maestre being the older man, you know, turning pro so late, he'd probably fade, he's probably gonna fade in those later rounds with Stanionis and his normal work rate, but, to be to be fair to Maestro, he finished quite strong. You know, he didn't he didn't he didn't look like he had any weaknesses in there, which is a strange statement to make. You know, considering he was going to be fighting Stanionis. You know, Stanionis was a huge, huge, huge favorite going into that fight. Way too big in the end. Those numbers were, were laughable. I think Maestro was something like an eight to one underdog, which was crazy. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing Maestro again. Um, I decided to tweet after the fight, you know, it'd be a weird fight and it probably doesn't make any sense, but I wouldn't mind seeing Maestro in there against someone like a Connor Ben. But obviously, as for Stanionis, you know, he'll move on to bigger things you'd, you, you'd have to think. Um, and obviously, yeah, I think these belts are probably going to get fragmented, you know, if, if Terence Crawford is to fight at 154, which we know he, he's going to be doing that. I'm guessing that the belts are going to wind up becoming vacant soon, so everyone's going to be going to be there trying to pick up the scraps. Um, what else did we see? Yeah, straight to the main event, I guess. Uh, I'm going to give my take and then come to you, Eddie, after that. Canelo, now 
now 61 and 2 with two draws. It was his 65th pro fight, a unanimous decision against Jaime Munguia. Um, crazy thing, you know, Munguia loses his O, he's now 43 and 1, but to think that these guys combined records going in the other night was 103 and 2 with two draws, that's just insane, man. But anyway, the two Mexican Mexican Warriors got it on for the undisputed super middleweight world titles, Munguia down in the fourth round. Um, listen, it was a good start from Munguia, he arguably won the first three rounds, and then, like I say, in that fourth round, a right uppercut put him down. Um, crazy drama, you know, because he sprung straight back up off the canvas. Obviously, it was the first time he'd ever been down in his career. And I thought he might have might have got up a little bit too soon. But obviously, he got through the round. Canelo won that round 10-8. And it was, you know, it was, it was kind of, um, you know... At a good time for Canelo, I guess. If you've lost the first three rounds, you know, all of a sudden you score you score a 10-8 round just straight back in the fight, you know, with that one punch he landed. And he needed that 10-8 round, which was great for him. But then the tide did seem to turn really into Canelo's favor after that. I gave him the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth rounds. Munguia did have moments where he would, you know, really let his hands go in like a 20-punch combination. And it was really eye-catching. But Canelo's guard as well so hard to penetrate that defense um Canelo's offense as well was calculated just like his defense and Canelo was bossing it really you know like I say Munguia was fighting in spurts and it was eye-catching but it wasn't enough and Canelo you could see that experience was was so evident there you know he's too clever for Munguia and when Munguia was being backed up he was largely ineffective I did give Munguia the ninth round. I thought he had a lot of success in in that round with his combinations. The tenth round was a close round, could have gone either way. Um, I, I think in the end I kind of gave it to Munguia, a little bit of a sympathy round. Uh, the eleventh round was close. I gave that one to Canelo, and then the the twelfth round was definitely a Canelo round. So in the end, my scorecard was one fifteen, one thirteen. So I had Canelo by three in the end. But like I say, he won the bout unanimously. And I want to come straight to you, Eddie. What did you make of it? Um, some people thought Canelo was on the slide. I don't know what that was all about. He looked great. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I don't know what they're talking about. Munguia is not no, you know, half-assed type challenger. I mean, regardless of whether he had the experience. I mean, look at look at, look at how many fights he had. I mean, obviously a lot of those fights aren't you know, at the highest level, but what I'm saying is he's been in the ring quite a bit. So he, he's, you know, one, he's been at the high level for, at a high level for a while. So you got to give the kid credit. He's a big kid. You know, I didn't realize he was as big as he was. Um, you know, he, he was sharp early, you know, he like he threw a lot of good. He was trying to, I seen him trying to do the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the bibble, the, you know, keeping the jab, you know, and the length, you know, and, and, and keeping his hands on Canelo a little bit, keeping him occupied. But, at the end of the day, I think the punching power of Canelo to him and, um, you know, obviously the IQ and was just a little bit too much. You know, he wasn't he wasn't able to continue to keep, even with his high punch count, trying at times to, to overwhelm Canelo. It was just he was just too calm and, and understood what he was doing too well at this point. Um, landing shots on his arms, you know, beating down his body. He just really after after a few, after a while it just becomes like, you know, a lot of his punches were arm punches. You know what I'm saying? You know, to to, to some degree, he wasn't able to put together a serious onslaught. You know, like to to at least bother a Canelo. Like early on, you would even get a little nervous. Like some of those shots look like, damn, it might hurt him. But he pretty much after, after you know four after he dropped them and few rounds after that he was just beating on his arms and his body so much it was just it was wearing the kid down you could tell you could his face you could tell by looking at his face not that it was all beat up and bruised but it was just his the expression on his face you could tell he was like damn I didn't expect to be in this kind of a situation but all in all Canelo I thought looked good you know he, he he's still Canelo you know right like he was saying at the end of the thing right now he feels like he's the best out there I mean, we can't overlook Bivol because he actually beat him, but <laughs> he feels like pound for pound, he's the man. And, you know, it's hard to argue, you know, totally with that. But um, he's still got a little more proven to do. He hasn't fought Benavides yet. 
I don't even know if he will. Uh, he hasn't beaten Bevel, so there's some there's a little bit of proven left on his on his uh, on on his plate to you know for him to really uh, you know for for us to believe that he's still you know the top of the, the cream of the crop, the top of the top. So I mean, he still looks good. Like I said, he still can do it, but I'm not sure. But uh, all in all, great fight. Hats off to the youngin for getting in there, putting in the work. You know what I mean, and trying his best to win. I uh, hope to see him again. I think he. I think there's a lot of guys out there he could beat. Um, just not Canelo right now. But um, yeah, all in all, great fight, great card. Uh, love to see that kind of thing again. Yeah, it was a great fight in the end. Like I say, fantastic for boxing, fantastic for Mexican boxing, and you know, I think everyone kind of won from that you know Munguia takes a loss and yeah he does lose his O and he was only a few fights away from equaling Floyd's Floyd's record but um you know he, he goes away with his stocks even higher than they were before and everyone wants to see him again you know he's still uh, you know they were talking about how young he is that's that's something I think was over talked a little bit I don't think he's as fresh as his age suggests he is obviously he's had a whole heap of fights and he's been in many many wars but you know he he, he does still have a few big nights left in him left in him I think so I don't think he he comes out as a big loser here kind of thing I think he will still be in the mix with the big names we'd still love to see him in there with many other guys in that division like for example you know um, wouldn't mind seeing him in with Billy Joe Saunders if he can come back, you know, ever, if he's ever going to be able to come back on weight. Um, you know, there's there's other guys, obviously, like Benavidez, wouldn't mind seeing him with with, with Munguia, wouldn't mind seeing Caleb Plant with Munguia. There, there's many fights out there for him at super middle. Uh, moving on, though, moving to the humble Civic Center in humble Texas, USA, over here, friend of the show, Susie Ramadan. She picked up win number 30. She's 30 and 4. A TKO for her in the fourth round against Judith Hatchbolt, who's now 5 and 19. So a nice little win there for Susie Ramadan. Moving now to the final card to mention. It went down at the Tokyo Dome in Tokyo, Japan. We're going to start with the undercard, of course. TJ Doheny. I don't even know what to say anymore. This guy is unbeatable in Tokyo. He's gone 3-0 and with three KO wins in Tokyo in his last three fights because he got the TKO once again against another fighter. I don't think they did bets on this fight in the end. I couldn't see any odds on it at all. So I don't know if you you know if I don't know if anyone was able to place a bet on it with a different bookmaker, but I couldn't see it on my on my bet three six five. But TJ Doheny, I don't know if he's upset the odds there, but again he boxed an undefeated Japanese prospect and he stopped him in round four. So Doheny now twenty six and four and Brill Bayogos now seven and one with a draw. Also on the card we saw Takuma Inue. The brother of Naoya, he's now 20 and 1. He was down on the deck in that fight though against Sho Ishida, now 34 and 4. But Inue with the unanimous decision over 12, a successful defense of his WBA bantamweight world title. An unsuccessful defense though for the WBO bantamweight world title between Jason Maloney and Yoshiki Takai. Um, Jason Maloney. Like I say, loses the fight. He loses his world title. He's now 27 and 3. Yoshiki Takai was pretty good, I have to say. I was quite impressed with him. He set a good pace, um, good jab. You know, I liked everything he was doing. He was mixing up his shots from head to body. Um, yeah, he's moved to 9 and 0. He's looked really good. He's picked up a belt. And I have to say, I hadn't seen too much of him prior to the other night. But I thought, you know, obviously Jason Maloney going in as the favourite. I've seen enough of Jason Maloney. He's a good fighter. He's a solid fighter. He's been in there with Inoue himself. I don't think he, he would have been, you know, too worried about going out there to Japan. They know him. They love him out there. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I expected him to win this fight, really. He did have moments late on in the fight. That's the thing. He seemed to start really putting the pressure on late on. And that's when Takai seemed to slip a little bit. I think probably from, like, rounds like sort of 7 to 11, that's where Maloney started to really get back in the fight, and Takai looked 
you know, very tired. But then Takai had a good 12th round, I think, just to close things out. And by by the point, you know, Maloney started started picking up the pace a little bit, he, he was just too far behind on the scorecards because Takai was so sharp from the off. Um, so, yeah, commiserations for Jason Maloney. Moving up the card once again, Saigo Akui. He's now 20-2 and two with a draw, a unanimous decision there against Taku Kuahara, who's now 13-2, and two, a defense there of Akui's WBA flyweight world title. And then moving straight to the main event, Naoya Inoue, now 27-0, and 0, a TKO for him against Luis Neri, now 35-2. and 2. It was, of course, for the undisputed Super Bantamweight World Titles, a sixth round TKO for Naoya Inoue, although, Eddie, he didn't have it all his own way. He was down on the deck in the first round. I cannot believe it. I actually placed a bet that he would win the fight by knockout before the 10th round and that he wouldn't be knocked down. Can you believe it? And the one time that I ever backed that weird bet, he gets put down by Lewis Neary. After the fact, a lot of people are coming out saying, well, you know, Lewis Neary's a big puncher. You know, this, this, you know, we always knew it was going to be a hard fight for Inoue. I don't think many people were saying that before the fight. We saw Brandon Figueroa take Neary apart. And I don't think anyone was giving Neary a chance at all. But after the hard fight, well, I say it was a hard fight. After that, that one incident, a lot of people came out, you know, banging the drum for Neary. I think it was a bit of a defence mechanism, to be totally honest with you. But listen, Naoya Inoue, when he got put down, he got back. Uh, one thing I noticed, he didn't get back up straight away. He stood, you know, he, he, he stayed down for the entirety of the count. That made me think, oh, that shot might have been a bit bigger than I first thought it was. I didn't really, I don't think I watched it on the replay, but I thought, I didn't think it was a much of a shot initially when I first saw it. And you can, I'm sure, disagree with me, Eddie, and say your piece in a sec. But I didn't think it was a massive shot when it first landed. But when he took the count, I thought, oh, okay, maybe it was. But there was no doubt in my mind whatsoever that when he got back up off the canvas, you know, I knew he was going to still stop Lewis Neary. I, I was even more confident. I thought, oh dear, what have you just done there by putting him down? Um, so yeah, you could actually get Inoue by KO at odds of 4-9, to nine, which was insane odds after he got dropped. Like, they were insane odds. I ended up making some good money on that fight in play. Um, but yeah, back to what I'm saying really good fight from Inoue, came back in that second round, straight away started to dominate, you know, with a little bit of desperation, but not too much, and, you know, ends up dropping Neary in that second round, obviously, completely bosses things from there, um, I thought he was excellent, again, mixing it from head to body, his body shots, he, he landed some horrendous looking body shots on 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 Lewis Neary. Lewis Neary to his credit took him really well and you could see he was bang up for the fight. Um you know, he was he wasn't very good against Figueroa. He was really really uh bang up for this one against Inoue here in Japan. And like I say, Inoue did put him down again in the 5th and then got the stoppage in the 6th. So aside from that moment of madness where he found himself on the canvas and showed us all that Maybe he's not quite the monster that we that we thought he was. Is that harsh? I don't know. He's definitely human, though. He's definitely human, even if he's only partly human. But I tell you what, after being dropped and getting back up off the canvas, after taking that count, there was a mission in his mind. And that mission was to get Lewis Neary out of there as quick as he physically could have done without making another mistake. And he pretty much did that. So all in all, aside from that little moment of madness fantastic performance from Inoue and we're going to forget he got knocked down I think in a few months time we're going to forget that that happened because he was flawless after that Eddie yeah I agree I mean I, I don't know about forgetting about the knockdown I mean but most people are going to talk about how he came back more so than the knockdown um, he's, a, he's a fantastic young fighter one of the best that there is in boxing and you know there's nothing more to say I mean the kid, he, you know, I guess he shows certain certain vulnerability by getting dropped, but then just looks like once he gets up, he's like a machine. He just, you know what I mean? Once you take out one piece, there's something else coming, you know, 10 times as hard. So, um, 
you know, just the power, the speed, the skill, all of it. He's got everything. Um, doesn't matter whether he fights an orthodox southpaw, you know, guy who could punch or, or could box. It just it's hard. It's starting start to gonna, it's going to be start. It's going to get to the point where it's going to be difficult to find, you know, competition at those weights for him. And he's going to have to continue to go up. And I think just like I figured for um, the only thing that's going to be like, like I was thinking for, um, uh, what's his name? God damn it. Excellent. Excellent fighter too. He's got a little old. Uh, Donaire? Lomachenko. Lomachenko. Oh. Lomachenko. I was thinking that, you know, the, the thing that would beat him would be weight, meaning going too high in weight, fighting guys beyond where he should, you know, where he should be fighting to the point of, like, have, in, in order to make fights. You understand what I'm saying? And I think that's probably the only way. I, I don't see anyone until he gets old, old, that is beating this kid at those weights. I just think he's, you know, he's going to have to look for challenges elsewhere because it's just not going to happen. Unless, he can, unless somebody catches him and gets him out of there with one shot, like a one-off type situation, I just, I just really don't see it. He's looking real dominant there. I mean, it's like he's doing so. He's, 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 and he's doing it kind of. I don't want to say effortlessly because his last fight he got dropped, but just the way it is, just, it just looks smooth. It looks like he's, he means to do everything. Is like I said, his IQ is high. Everything. It's just hard. It's hard to find a hole in his, his game. You know what I mean? Maybe the fact that he does sometimes get hit gets hit, you know, with, 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 with shots at, you know, taking chances, you know, is where you can see slight vulnerability, but unless you got somebody like, um, you know, they, they, they can compete with him skill wise power. It's just, it's just too much. There's too many things he has on his side. So it's, um, it's going to be a long road. It's, it's going to be a long night for anybody getting in the ring with that young guy right now. And I'm looking forward to seeing him in the future. Yeah, I think we can all agree with that. Cannot wait to see him out again. You know, this this guy is 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 a phenom. You know, um, yeah, still you know has to be top three pound for pound on every single list. Every single time I see someone say, "Here's my pound for pound list," I look at the free the free names at the top. If it's not Crawford, Inoue, and Usyk in any order, sorry, not Usyk. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. Am I? Yeah, wait. Am I losing my mind? <laughs> Yeah, Usyk, Usyk, yeah, it has to be Usyk, Inoue, and Crawford in any order. Uh, if I don't see those three in the top three, then I just scroll right past because it's, it's a meaningless list in my opinion. But anyway, that brings the review part to a close. It's now time to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the hard-hitting heavyweight contender. It is, of course, Mr. Cassius Cheney. Cassius, welcome back on the show, my friend. It's been a long time. Hey, man. Yeah, it's been quite a while, man, but happy to be back. And um, I'm just looking forward to uh, finishing up camp and getting ready for my next fight, you know? There we go. We'll get into it in a moment. But yeah, we last spoke back in November of 2019, pre-COVID, uh, su such a long time ago. At the time, you were getting ready to fight Nick Jones. Um, you ended up stopping him in three rounds. How have things been since then, my friend? Uh, everything's been good, man. You know, just chipping away and just trying to stay consistent, um, stay out the way, just <clears throat> stay healthy. Um, stay focused, stay motivated, and um, just just grinding, man, just grinding. And yeah, obviously after that Nick Jones fight, you know, you picked up a couple more wins before running into George Arias and subsequently losing your own by split decision. It needs to be it needs to be said. Um, we saw obviously Jared Anderson take care of Arias in quick fashion. Did you feel you won the Arias fight, Cassius? Talk me through it just briefly. Uh, I thought it was close. You know, I didn't really know how I felt about it. I thought it was close. I knew that, you know, um, I didn't really perform. It was a lot of stuff that was going on, and, and I kind of knew that uh, it was either I take the fight or, you know, we kind of just lose out on camp money and things like that. So, you know, I took a risk, and I thought that um, it was close. I don't think either one of us really did much, you know, but, you know, it was in his hometown, and, you know, that's how I go sometimes. So it wasn't not much for me to really be totally whatever about. You know what I'm saying? It just, 
um, I just look forward to the next thing. You know, I just wanted to heal up, get healthy, and then look forward to my next fight, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think it needs to be said as well that I think he didn't do himself any favours against Anderson. I think he was, you know, he's better than that normally. Um, since the Arias fight, getting back onto you, you've had two more fights, obviously. Most recently, stopping former WBA heavyweight world champion Trevor Bryan. Talk me through that fight, Cassius, being your most recent one. Uh, that was just a good fight for me. Um, I was familiar with Trevor, just seeing him throughout the years of him boxing and things like that. And uh, I just knew that um, I just had to come in there prepared. Uh, I had a good camp. You know, I decided to train back home with my um, longtime coach, uh, Fred Weaver, who I started with as an amateur. And um, finally, you know, it felt good. It felt like the right time for me to come back home, given the experience I've, of coaches I've went through and met and learn from and you know I was able to come back and um, just have a good camp to where I was just more mature and understanding of things that I wanted wanted and needed to do. Yeah because if I remember that fight correctly um, early on in the fight you had quite a low punch output and I was wondering like what's going on here then as the rounds went on obviously Trevor Bryan started to gas that's when you stepped up the pressure and you got him out of there in the end with a brutal right hand was that all part of the game plan? I wouldn't say it was part of the game plan but I mean I had been out the ring quite a while so it wasn't like I knew where you know what I mean? Like, I was a little bit apprehensive on, you know, where I was, uh, you know, stamina-wise and where I was as far as just being in the ring. You know, I was out the ring for a year. So, I wasn't just – I wasn't really trying to just burn myself out. You know what I mean? My whole objective was just to try to just, you know, keep them off me and just be smart. And uh, I knew eventually that I'll, I'll hit them. Yeah, and like I say, you really got him in the end. Um, yeah, I do remember watching that fight. I stayed up till, you know, 4 or 5 a.m. to watch it live. And I remember thinking early on, like, I didn't think your punch output was that high. And I'm beginning to ask myself, is is Cassius gassed out? But then all of a sudden, like, like, like I say, the opportunity presented itself. And then you had more than enough, you know, still left in the tank for sure to get him out. And it was a fantastic stoppage. Um, let's look to the future. Your next fight has been announced June the 7th is the date in Florida against Michael Hunter for the interim WBA heavyweight world title. Rumors were that it was initially going to be against Martin Bacoli. Someone on Twitter asked you, how did Michael Hunter leapfrog Martin Bacoli? To which you answered, you answered the tweet by saying, long story. Are you able to shed any further light on that for us, Cassius? Uh, I don't, I think I said, did I say long story? I don't even know. I yeah. think it was, I think it was a lot of, uh, I have no idea. I think it was more on Bacoli's side, the situation um, with his team or something like that with his management. Um, you know, uh, people complain about me leapfrogging uh, people and getting the Bacoli situation. So it was a lot of little, um, little tricks and stuff going on that, you know, uh, haven't been said or told to me either, you know. So I understand that people feel a certain way about uh, Michael Hunter. I don't even know because Michael Hunter just, he got ranked. So it's not like he's not ranked, you know what I mean? So I really don't know. I just think that, uh, you know, some people can make calls and make things happen. I don't know, you know, but, you know, it's a cool fight for me. You know what I mean? I'm okay. I'm cool with it. And Cassius, I remember back in the day speaking to you when you were promoted by main events. I genuinely don't know who you're promoted by these days. Uh, I'm with Don King. I'm with oh, you with Don now. Okay, with, okay. Yeah, yeah. So. Cool. cool. Um, okay. I see Mike is too, actually. So I think we're both with Don. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, both with Don. Um, are you anticipating the hardest fight of your life here, Cassius, or not? I know you. I know you. You rate Hunter pretty highly. Uh yeah yeah he's a clever fighter you know what I mean he's very very clever but um I don't know I'm I'm rating it just a, a a good fight you know I think he has things that he sh he has strengths and he has weaknesses you know like most of us but 
for me, I just got to go in there and do what I do well and just be smart, work off the jab, and be the big man. You know what I mean? If you let him bully you, he'll bully you. So if you let him frustrate you, he'll frustrate you. So um, for me, it's just about being smart, sticking to the game plan, and, and uh, you know, chipping away at him, you know. So I'm not really – I'll be honest, I'm not really – stressed out about it i'm just excited to get back in the ring to be honest yeah it's a fight i'm very much looking forward to as well um you you pretty much answered my next question just there i was going to ask you know how do you see the fight playing out obviously michael's experience as an amateur goes a long way as a pro he's been in there with the likes of martin bacoli alexander povetkin alexander Usyk. but as you say you're the bigger man and you're coming into this fight with better momentum i think it's fair to say than he is Right, Cassius, I can barely hear a word you're saying. You've gone all, all strange. Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah, he's been he's been in some wars. I'm a fresher, I believe. I'm a fresher fighter, and I think that um he's been in some tough fights. You know what I'm saying? He's won some tough fights. He's had draws in some tough fights, and I think that uh, you know I do have the bigger punch. You know, I you know you know he's he's been really really good because he's so much more athletic than everybody mostly you know most of the guys that he's fought he's been asset more athletic than outside of Usyk so now you know he's fighting the or athlete as well so I'm just looking forward to seeing um how it plays out I'm just just gotta stay away from the antics you know and just stay focused towards the game plan and and just have fun in there you know what I mean and Cassius, there's a part of me that just can't see this fight going 12 rounds. Do you think we could possibly see 12 here? Uh, if it's 12, I don't even know how many rounds it is. But is. I'm going to assume uh, it's 12, just because it's for the interim title. I could be wrong. Um, do I see it going 12? Mm, not really. Not really. I think one of us is going to have to commit and my 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 idea is like I said I think I have the the bigger punch um he's a sneaky puncher but I don't think that uh I, I think if you look at it like I know we got the same amount of knockouts but you know um when I hurt people I hurt them for real so it's like I think it's a little bit different you know and um I also just think like I said you know he can He's a clever guy. I think he's just more clever than what people uh, feel. So they just go at him. They just go chasing him. You know, um, I kind of made that mistake with Aries in a sense, just trying to follow him around. In this situation, I don't think it's, you know, I just got to be smart and pick and choose when to go at him and bang him up. Bang his up, bang him, whatever. You know, just be smart, you know. You you went a little bit funny towards the end. I don't need you to repeat any of it. It's all good, but I'm just warning you for the next question, and it is my final question for you, Cassius. Okay. Not not this weekend, but next. We'll finally see that undisputed heavyweight title fight, Usyk Fury. Um, I know you've got history there, but who wins and how for you? Right now, I have to lean towards. Uh, I have to lean towards Fury right now, just because he's he's had that extra time. And he's big, and he knows how to make the fight just ugly. You know what I mean? Um, Usyk's is very good at fighting um, tough fights, you know, pretty. You know what I'm saying? Finishing the fights out pretty. But I just think um, Fury's going to be the bigger guy. And it's hard to find sparring for somebody like Fury unless you go get basketball players or something like that. You just, you know what I mean? You just had to move around the ring. I just... I just think Fury had enough time um, to prepare. And I also think that boxing sometimes looks forward to the next fight. And that next fight people want to see is, is Joshua and Fury at some point. So I think it's, I think it's going towards that, you know what I mean? Or Joshua and Wilder, you know, who knows. But I think it's going towards that type of uh, situation. Yeah, cannot wait for any of those fights to be made. Just before we wrap things up, Cassius, like I say, haven't had you on since pre-COVID. If you want to just close out just with a little message to the listeners before we let you go, my friend, the floor is yours. Uh, tune in. First of all, I want to say thank you for the interview. Tune in. 
June seventh, um, Miami, Florida. Uh, it's going to be a great night. It's going to be a great night of fights. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to winning. May the best man win. And uh, I'm just happy the camp is started. I got an opponent, so I'm just ready to go. There we go. Listen, Cassius, it's been great catching up again. Thank you for your time. Best of luck on the on the seventh of June, and we'll speak sometime afterwards for sure, my friend. Okay, thank you, Jay, man. I appreciate it. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. We're going to start here with a card that's been announced for July the 6th at the Prudential Center in Newark. Live on ESPN, we're going to see a homecoming fight for Shakur Stevenson. He steps in the ring with Artem Harutyunyan. Um, who else do we have on that card? We've got Oshiki Foster defending his world title against Robson Concesao. Um... So, yeah, that one to go down, like I say, July the 6th. Uh, Keyshawn Davis as well on the undercard. He steps in with Mexican Miguel Madueño, I think his name said. Um, so, all the best to all those guys there. Also, Arta Baturbiev has pulled out of his fight with Dimitri Bivol due to a injury sustained in training. That one was set to go down on June the 1st, postponed. Uh, you know, Bivol now has a new opponent. And it's it's a great shame because I can I've got to be very careful what I say on this, but Baturbiev has pulled out at least of his last three fights in a row against Anthony Yard, against Callum Smith, and now against against Dimitri Bivol. And there is there are people there are people that are very sure that something's amiss there there's there's something going on but like i say got to be quite careful what gets said uh also jaron ennis will be defending his welterweight world title the ibf against cody crowley that one to go down on july the 13th in philadelphia so matt are coming to philly um should be a good one there no undercard announced just yet for that one Uh, That's it for the news. Moving now to the preview part of the show. We're going to start here tomorrow in New York. We're going to see Micaiah Kreps, who's 7-0, stepping in the ring with friend of the show, Melissa Odessa Parker, 6-2. That's over eight rounds there at Super Bantamweight. All All the best there to Melissa. Uh, Moving now to the Palenque de la Feria in Agua Caliente, Mexico over here. Erica Cruz Fernand Erica Cruz Hernandez, sorry, not Fernandez. Uh, she fights here for the WBA World Super Bantamweight title. It's over 10 twos. Like I say, she's 17 and 2. She steps in with Nazarena Romero, who's 13 and 0 with a draw. This is a matchroom card, by the way. It's going to be live on the zone. Also on that card, the return to the ring for Eduardo Rocky Hernandez, 34-2, coming off that loss to Oshiki Foster. He steps in with Daniel Lugo, who people might remember. He's coming off a draw last time out to um, Maurizio Lara. So that one was back in February of this year. So people you know, will, will know that name. It's fresh in their minds. Daniel Lugo, 27-2 with a draw. Could be interesting there. Um, moving now to Ellesmere Port. Sports Village in Ellesmere Port, Cheshire, United Kingdom. I don't think we've ever been here before, but what we will see on this card is Paul Butler, 36 and 3, former world champion, friend of the show, stepping in the ring with Norbelto Jimenez, who's 33 and 10 with six draws. That won over 12 rounds for the vacant IBO Bantamweight World title. It's a M22 or M22 Promotions card. That's Joe Gallagher's promotional outfit. Also on the undercard as well, we're going to see Callum Johnson returning to the ring. No opponent just yet for him. Another friend of the show. Moving now to the York Hall, Bethnal Green, London. This one goes down on Saturday on TNT. Let's touch on the undercard. We're going to see... Um, ooh, where 
where should we start here? There's a few guys. I'm not going to run through all the opponents and the rest of it, but a few guys on the undercard. Obviously, we, we had Archie Sharp on last week's show. He's he's out on the undercard once again. His first fight back with Frank Warren. We're also going to see Ben Fow on the undercard. We're going to see Tommy Fletcher, Royston Barney Smith back in action. But the bigger fights, we're going to see Mark Jeff... Oh, sorry, that's the wrong card. We're going to see Ryan Garner, 14-0, and stepping in with Liam Dillon, 13-1 and with a draw. This one's over 10 rounds at Super Featherweight for the WBC International Super Featherweight title. Um, it's an interesting fight. Obviously, Liam Dillon last time out went the distance against um, Reese Bellotti, even though you know he lost unanimously, but he still went 12 rounds. And Reese Bellotti, if nothing else, is a really big puncher. So I was quite shocked when I saw that the bookies are expecting Ryan Garner to stop uh, to, to, to stop Liam Dillon. I'm expecting this one to go the distance. Ryan Garner to win on points, I think, is probably the bet. Though, Liam Dillon to win on points is 10-1, to 1, which I think is crazily overpriced. I just don't understand the bookies' stance on this fight here. Also on the card as well, we're going to see Francesco Grandelli, 18-2 and two with two draws. This one's for the EBU Silver Featherweight title. He steps in with Scotland's very own Nathaniel Collins, 14-0 and 0 with seven KOs. Always good to watch him. Um, and then, yeah, jump into the main event once again. Some odds here that I think are well worth mentioning to our listeners. Denzel Bentley, currently 18-3 and three with a draw. It's for the vacant WBO international middleweight title. He's coming off, Denzel Bentley, that dreadful performance at the back end of last year against Nathan Heaney. He was absolutely terrible in that fight there. And... He steps in here with Danny Dignam, who's 16 and 1 with a draw. Now, Danny Dignam and um, and Denzel Bentley both have something in common, and it's the fact that they both went out there to the States and boxed Janibek Alim Kanuli. And obviously, we know that Danny Dignam got splattered by him in just two rounds, and Denzel Bentley managed to take Alim Kanuli the distance over 12. And Alim Kanuli looked really bad that night, but. Denzel Bentley didn't really do too much, in my opinion. So I think based off of that, the bookies have made their prices up. And basically, I don't know if this is going to happen. I'm just saying it's a price too big to skip over. But right now, and I'm looking at the odds right now as we record this show, you've got Denzel Bentley to win this fight on points at 5-1. to one, And the over-under is set... At uh, It was actually 6.5 rounds. It's now gone up to 7.5. I'm not too surprised. I just don't understand why, just because Danny Dignam got knocked out in a couple of rounds by Janibek, why on earth they're so sure Denzel Bentley, coming off one of the worst performances of his career, is going to go in there and just blitz him out of there. I just don't understand those odds. I really don't. If he does go and do that, then fair play to him. But, you know, Danny Dignam is a, is a fit kid. Um, and, you know, it's it's like Last Chance Saloon, I think. I think he's happy to be back on TV, and he, it's a must-win fight to reignite his career, so I think we're going to see a good Danny Dignam, a hungry Danny Dignam, and Denzel Bentley looked all but hungry in the last time we saw him under the lights against Nathan Heaney, so... I just don't get those odds. Um, moving now to the Cardiff International Arena in Cardiff, Wales, United Kingdom. Also, this is on Saturday night, and it's going to be live on Sky Sports. A couple fights to mention over here. Another really interesting price. We've got 17-0 Mark Jeffers in a 10-rounder here. He steps in with Darren Johnston. Now, I couldn't tell you anything about Darren Johnston at all, but what I will say is he's an undefeated fighter, and he's 8-0. That's about all I can tell you about the guy. He's got two KOs, which would indicate to me that he's probably, you know, more of a boxer than, than, a, than a knockout guy who's going to stand in the pocket and bang with you. However, Mark Jeffers is 17-0 with four KOs, and I just cannot get my head around this, but Mark Jeffers, they're expecting him to get the knockout, which is a very rare thing in itself, but you can get 2-1 to one for Jeffers to win by decision. Makes no sense at all to me that I cannot understand why they think he's going to go in there and stop this guy. Again, I could be wrong, and I don't know anything about Darren Johnston, but, you know, Mark Jeffers has only stopped... 4 of 17, so 13 men have gone the distance, and, you know, 
some of those men, or most of those men, have had much worse looking records than this this guy Johnston. So I don't understand that one there. That's another price that has to be mentioned. Uh, also on the card as well, Reese Edwards, 15-0. and 0. It's for the vacant WBA Intercontinental Featherweight title. It's over 10 rounds. He steps in with Thomas Patrick Ward, 34-1 and 1 with a draw. Now, listeners will know that I've been a little harsh. I've been a little critical of Thomas Patrick Ward because I think he padded out his record and he, he took ages doing it. Then he stepped up against Otterbeck Kolmatov and got banged out. We saw Kolmatov obviously fight Raymond Ford most recently for the world title. And, you know, he's a good fighter. He was winning that fight. Raymond Ford needed a knockout and got it in the last few seconds of the fight. So there's no shame in losing to Otterbeck Kolmatov. But that's his one loss. And they're deciding to write him off as well when I'm looking at the odds here. Because Thomas Patrick Ward is 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 9-4 to four for a decision win. And let's be honest, that's how he would win the fight. He's, he's not a big puncher at all. It's more than likely that he'll win the fight on points. And and Reese Edwards, I mean, he's coming off a win. He's coming off his career best performance because he actually stepped in there with a really recognisable name. He got in there with, um, with, with Brad Foster and he managed to get the, the decision that night. But there was only one judge scoring it. It was the referee, Ron Kearney. He was refereeing and judging. There wasn't three judges in that fight. And if there was three judges in that fight... It very well could have gone the other way because most people had Brad Foster winning that one. So he's coming off the back of that, and I've got no idea why they're favouring him so highly against Thomas Patrick Ward, who is a you know very seasoned pro and very seasoned amateur. And also um, another crazy thing here, and I just can't believe my eyes. Reese Edwards has only gone ten rounds on one occasion. This will be his second ten round fight. Thomas Patrick Ward. You know, he's been 10 rounds several times. I just don't understand it. He's even gone 12 rounds before. So I don't understand that one at all. I I, I really don't get it. I don't think he's lost that many steps, Um, you know, even if he has regressed a little bit. What else do we have? We have the main event, Jessica McCaskill defending her WBA and IBO welterweight world title. She's 12-3 and with a draw. She steps in with... The Welsh, Lauren Price, 6-0 again. This fight here, very much, um, you know, expected to go the distance. I'd be very shocked if anyone gets stopped here. We know McCaskill's a real tough girl. And Lauren Price has got the the youth on her side and, you know, shown quite a good boxing brain and good boxing ability since turning pro. And obviously, we know as a gold medalist in the in the amateurs, in the Olympics. So, again, you'd expect it to go the distance, but I don't think Jessica McCaskill should be a 6-1 to one underdog to win on points. I don't understand that. She's also 7-2 to two by any method. You know, it does look like she's on the slide now, Jessica McCaskill, but... It's a massive step up for Lauren Price. This is a mammoth step up, step up in class, and I don't think Jessica McCaskill should be that big of an underdog. Um, also on that undercard, I almost missed out there. We're going to see Huey Fury, 27-3, and three, back in action. It's good to see him out. He steps in with Patrick Corte, who's 21-3 and three with a draw. They're expecting Huey Fury to get the stoppage there within three rounds. That's over eight rounds there. And we're also going to see Lewis Edmondson, 8-0, and oh, stepping in with Joel McIntyre, 20-8. and eight. Again, you'd probably have to back Lewis Edmondson to win that one on points over eight rounds at light heavy. Moving now, though to the big card that goes down in Australia on on I don't I'm not entirely sure what time this is going to be on I don't know if it's early hours of Sunday for UK or what it's 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 very confusing I should probably check it while you're talking about it Eddie so I will come to you straight away just to make things a little bit easier I'm going to start here with the main event which we don't often do Vasil Lomachenko 17 and 3 Stepping in with George Cambosos Jr., 21-2. and two. It's for the IBF and IBO lightweight world titles. Talk to me about that fight. Yeah, yeah. That's a, it's a very interesting fight. You know what I mean? Uh, George Cambosos, you know, coming off those those fights with Devin Haney and losing to Devin Haney. But, I mean, I, if I know Cambosos' his mentality, he's not thinking, you know, He's not looking in the past anyway, and he's thinking he's a completely different fighter, even though these two guys have fought. And most people think that, um, that you know, Blomachenko got the better of it, even though 
you know, Haney got the Haney, Haney got the win. Uh, we also know that the triangle theories typically do not work in boxing. So um, this is just a whole new fight. It has nothing to do with any of their previous fights. We have to just focus on the two guys that are in there. And in my opinion, unless Lomachenko is just old now, which I don't see him being, you know, like I, I just his recent performance with with like with Haney and just him in general. Like I just don't see it happening that quick, and I think he's just got a little too much skill and understanding um, and boxing ability than uh, to to really. For I don't want to say Cambosis can't do anything because he can get in there and and obviously surprises like he did with uh, Tiafimo Lopez. But I just really don't see it. I think I still think Lomachenko's just footwork is too good, and you know it's just going to be a really really rough night for Cambosis. However, you never know. Um, he can get in there and surprise us all, but uh, I just, I just, I, I doubt it. I'm going to be honest. I, I think I see Lomachenko um, maybe winning a decision, maybe even a late stoppage. Yeah, I think I have to side with you there. Um, I think I would definitely lean more towards the the points win. Um, a late stoppage would be quite quite a statement. I do think Lomachenko has probably lost a step or two. Um, I think it's important that you brought up the Haney fights. Obviously, they were completely not competitive against Haney. You know, uh, sorry, against against Cambosos when Haney went to Australia and beat him in you know in back to back fights over twenty four rounds. I don't think Cambosos won a single round out of all twenty four, if my memory serves me right. And obviously, I'm a guy that feels Lomachenko won the fight against Haney. So, yeah, you you touched on it, and it and it is important to bring up. Although we we stick with the triangle theory is not working thing but it has to be mentioned um i think cambosos is an extremely tough fighter you know obviously been in there with lomachenko that's a guy again another triangle theory he beat he beat uh Sorry, been in there with Tiafimo Lopez. He beat Tiafimo Lopez, and Tiafimo Lopez obviously beat very narrowly uh, Lomachenko as well. So there's a lot of things to there's a lot of tangibles there to to cling on to. Um, I've just got this feeling though that Cambosos is going to do better in this fight than most people think he'll he'll do. You know, obviously the fights in Australia, um, they you know the crowd were not able to help him against Haney, but I've just got a feeling here. You know, he's going to be the bigger guy, obviously. Um, he always comes in good shape. I've just got this feeling, even though I think stylistically it's you know he, he, the unorthodox style of Lomachenko, whereas Cambosos is pretty straightforward, pretty pretty much a textbook boxer. I think you know style wise it's not a good matchup, but I've just got this sneaky feeling that that. I don't want to say Lomachenko is going to look vulnerable. I still favor him to win the fight, but I've just got this feeling that Cambosos is going to do a lot better than people think. I could be wrong. He's a nice guy, Cambosos. I wouldn't mind seeing him win, but I've just got this sneaky suspicion he's he's not going to disgrace himself here like he did against Haney. I think he's going to win some rounds. Um, it seems like you're dying to come in and say something, Eddie. Oh, oh no, I'm not going to hit the button, but no, yeah, I, I, that I can agree with. He's going to one thing about Cambosis is that he's going to definitely give the best account of himself, the, the best account of himself that he possibly can, you know, with, with, you know, the lack of ability maybe to compete boxing wise with, with a Lomachenko, but he's definitely going to put his best foot forward and try to, you know, upset the odds. I mean, I don't know what the odds are saying right now, but, um, I just, I just really don't think, even with his focus and determination, and his, uh, his belief in himself, I just still don't think he has enough of what it takes, style-wise, especially, uh, still skill or style. That's going to really do anything. That's going to be something that Lomachenko hasn't already seen and dealt with easily in the past. Now, I'm not going to say easily because, like I said, his this guy's mind is on a different level sometimes and he comes in and he's going to try but yeah he's he, he's, he's going to be a hell of a struggle also on the card friend of the show Andrew Maloney 26 and 3 boxes for the uh, for the for the WBC interim super flyweight world title against Pedro 
Guevara, who's 41 and 4 with a draw, but all four of his losses have either come by split decision or majority decision. He's a tough, tough guy, very experienced. Andrew Maloney obviously just saw his brother Jason lose last weekend his world title on the Inue undercard. Um, they're, they're so similar, Jason and, and, and Andrew, I think. You know, obviously they're identical twins, but at one point their boxing record was exactly the same. One of them seems to win a world title, then the other one does. Then one of them loses it, then the other one does. So they seem to be carbon copies of each other. Um, like I say, at one point, even their, their boxing records were exactly the same. So I, I would like to see Andrew Maloney win this fight. He is the favourite. He's expected to win. It's in Australia, which has to be mentioned. But I think Guevara is is a good a good priced underdog to win on points for that fight there. Because like I say, all of his losses have been close, and he's been in some good company. So I think he's about three to one to win on points. I think that's a bit overpriced in my opinion. But again, I would still favour Andrew Maloney. Um, we're also going to see a prospect that they're. They're, you know, obviously quite confident in Imam Katiev. He's six and zero, I think, with six KOs, if I'm not mistaken. It's a ten rounder for him at light heavyweight in a step up against Rickards Bolotniks of Latvia, twenty and seven with a draw. I don't know if he's boxed since he lost to Alexander Gvozdik. Uh, also on the card as well, friend of the show, Nina Hughes, fantastic lady, based in Essex, who's obviously a world champion. She comes all the way from Essex over to Australia here, defending her WBA bantamweight world title over 10 twos against Shanika Johnson, who's 15 and two. We know Shanika Johnson, you know, she comes to the, to, to, um, the UK and she went to the weigh-in and she applied body paint to her breasts and actually weighed in with her breasts out but they were they were body painted and you know no one knew so uh, she's she's quite a quirky character um and she's a good fighter you know she showed her toughness against Ellie Scottney she showed her toughness against Susie Ramadan she's extremely tough got a huge heart but i think that Nina Hughes and both girls are friends of the show by the way i got i got a lot of love for both ladies but i think Nina Hughes is going to be a little bit too cute a little bit too clever for Shanika Johnson and i don't think even though she's a long way away from home they're going to be able to take the win away from Nina Hughes i would expect her to win this one on points i think over 10 twos. Also on the card as well, Joseph Goodall, 10 and 2 with a draw. A um, little bit of a fun fighter, I guess. You know, I don't mind seeing him fight. He can certainly punch. He's got 9 KO wins. Uh, we saw him step in the ring and cause an upset when he boxed uh, Stefan Shaw. Uh, it stopped him back in July of last year, but then he got banged out most recently back in November to Effie Jagba. So he's back in the ring. He steps in with Faiga Opelu, who's 16 and 4 with two draws, the Samoan based in Australia, who's been around the block and he's been matched real tough. Um, so, yeah, this one shouldn't go to distance because, like I say, I think both men either stop you or get stopped kind of thing. But you'd have to expect Joseph Goodall to probably get the stoppage. Um, and last but certainly not least on the card, we're going to see a, a fighter called Hemi Ahio. He's 21 and 1. Uh, he also has to his name 16 KOs. He's a 33 year old, 6 foot tall heavyweight. So he's not very big. And he steps in with Lucas Big Daddy Brown, who's 31 and 5 these days. And obviously six foot five, so the much bigger guy in Lucas Brown. Lucas Brown coming off that 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 loss last time out. He lost to, to, to Mark Petrovsky. I didn't see that fight, I don't think. That one was in Dubai. But I did see the fight before that against Jarrell Big Baby Miller, where Lucas Brown showed me that he had quite a bit more in, in 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 his tank than maybe I thought he had. He's up there in age, like I say, 45 years of age now. But this guy here, Hemi Ohio, hasn't really boxed anyone. And the one loss that he took, he suffered to Faiga Apelu, who we just spoke about. He got stopped by Apelu in four rounds. And Apelu, again, triangle theories here, Apelu got stopped by Lucas Brown in seven rounds so i'm just pointing out the mere fact that lucas brown is the much bigger guy and managed to stop the one guy that ohio lost to 
And Ohio hasn't really boxed anyone. Lucas Brown, even though he's been stopped in all five of his losses, they've been in good company, very good company. And the 31 wins he's got, you know, he's, he's a massive puncher. And again, Lucas Brown is about a 4-1 to one underdog, but that's just to win by any method. There's no point looking at that price. I'm going to wait to see what the odds are going to be for him to win by a knockout because I think that's the only way he does get the win. He's not really, you know, a man that's designed to go the distance and it's an eight-rounder. I still don't think it will go eight. I think we're going to see a stoppage here, you know, either way. But I think Lucas Big Daddy Brown's about four to one and I think that's a huge price. I don't understand. I really don't understand that. And Lucas Brown has upset the odds time and time again time and time again with those heavy hands so all the best to Lucas Big Daddy Brown he's a friend of the show I'd like to see him win this one here I think he's at the tail end of his career now it has to be said but his story is truly remarkable um right that's all I've got to say Eddie I don't know if you had anything to to say to wrap things up before I come in with the outro no, my man, we got everything I'm it's, it's good Steve and <laughs> Lucas Brown are out there still trying to put his put his hands on guys and knock them out but but i don't know man you know the, the older we get the more dangerous each fight becomes so yeah you know uh, hopefully he does well but you know let's not hold our breath when it comes to that i want to see hopefully if, if he can get him out of there early that would be the best thing but yeah that's it dojo you can go with the outro my man yeah he certainly will come to get it done early that's what he likes to do um, he's a right character. He's a right character, Big Daddy Brown. I got a lot of time for the guy, but yeah, that is it for the preview part. In part one, we did the review part. Then we welcomed our special guest, the heavy hitting heavyweight, Mr. Cassius Cheney, who's boxing for an interim world title next month. In part two, we did the news. Just wrapped up the preview part. The final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 447 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge shout-out to this week's special guest, the hard-hitting heavyweight contender, Mr. Cassius Cheney. All the best to him in his big fight next month. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. Thanks once again for tuning in. That is about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we shall see you all again, same time next week.